This is SFNet Presents In The Know with host Barry Bobro, sponsored by Hilco Global. Well, welcome everybody to the next episode of the In The Know podcast. Really excited today. We have a very special guest, uh, Kathy Dick of Salt of the Earth Consulting is joining me today. Kathy is a very unique uh, actor in the, uh, in, the, in the banking world. She spent 26 years with uh, the OCC, rising to a very senior level, including being very involved in 2008 in the, uh, the guidance that was given to banks coming out of the Dodd-Frank Act. She then moved over to the consulting side of the table uh, and was working with Promontory uh, for a number of years, a, a very well-known consulting firm that was owned by IBM uh, on regulatory risk. Uh, spent a couple of years as head of risk for uh, USAA, and now has set up her own company, SOTE, which is Salt of the Earth Consulting. Uh, what a great name. That's why I got her on here, uh, that she's now doing uh, consulting with banks. And so um, without further ado, Kathy, welcome to the uh, welcome to the podcast. Great to see you. Thank you, Barry. Happy to be here. Yeah. Um, Kathy, I, I, your, 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 uh, your bio is, is all over the Salt of the Earth website, so I don't want to drag you through your your past, but I, I think you have a very unique perspective because you've been on effectively both sides of the discussion around regulatory, both from a financial institution standpoint and from the regulator. What would you say are the, the common misperceptions that each side has about the other? Well, that's a good question, Barry, because when I first uh, started my consulting work, I was talking to a former colleague from the OCC, and the question I got asked was essentially, what do these bankers pay you to do? <laughs> and I said, essentially to explain what you want them to do. So a common misperception, I think, is that examiners believe bankers can understand, you know, the uh, three or four sentences in an MRA and understand what it is they need to do to execute on some issue that an uh, examiner has identified. So frequently, and that's really what I did for the eight years I was at Promontory, was help bankers understand what it is the examiner is really looking for, because it's often, you know, knitted together in a mosaic from various reports they've been given or comments examiners have made. And another, um, I think, uh, misperception by examiners is that bankers are driven solely by making money and not maybe appreciating that most bankers, again, actually are very committed to the business and industry of uh, you know, providing uh, various financial products and services to consumers and businesses. So that those are two misperceptions I see, at least, you know, generally coming from examiners now with bankers uh, and having, you know, sat on the other side of the table uh, for the last few years of my career. I mean, one of the issue is the assumption that examiners have unlimited resources. They don't have oftentimes very many examiners to do the work, and they also don't have the you know same oftentimes you know depth of experience that a banker would have in any you know particular field. So, in that case, uh, much of my guidance was that you've got to be able to help those examiners understand better mm -hmm. some of the businesses that uh, they're tasked with you know reviewing. Um, and then oftentimes, I I think again, bankers believe examiners don't understand or don't want to understand some of the pressures involved, you know, in, again, banking businesses. And I think that oftentimes examiners do understand that, but they're really tasked with protecting either individual institutions or the system, not necessarily, you know, again, with uh, seeing banks being as profitable as they can be. So those are a couple of the misperceptions I guess I've seen. Well, certainly, you know, out of, out of 08, I really don't want to go all the way back to 08 more than I have to, but uh, the banks lost an awful lot of money. So just just seeking profit. I mean, I think even without the regular, regulatory overlay, banks would have made corrections to their structure and their risk management because they they can't keep doing that for their shareholders. It's not a, it's not a formula for success. That's right. So what so what did, if those are the the, the 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 playing field of you know what the perceptions are? What would you say are the the best practices uh, uh, for banks uh, to avoid getting themselves getting themselves into a poor position with their regulator. Well, I would say the best practice is you know recognizing that a lot of the supervision process is founded on trust. So, as a former examiner and you know again a banker as part of my career as well, what I 
know is that if that trust is lost between a supervisor and the financial institution, could be management, could be the board, that you're going to have a problem. And how that trust erodes or disappears is usually caused by, you know, a couple common things. One is, you know, some bankers will attempt to hide things. And again, counsel I give to uh, bankers that I've been working with is you have to, you know, be transparent with your regulars. When you have issues, you got to let them know. And um, they also want to know, you know, when good things are happening at the institution. But if an examiner finds that they're finding things that the banker hasn't told them about that erodes that trust very quickly. Um, not taking care of issues in a timely manner. And, you know, again, this works two ways in terms of some banks are um, setting timeframes that they really can't meet and therefore they sort of fail their own test. I've seen also examiners that ask for timeframes to fix issues that can't be met in terms of uh, sort of being set up to fail. So that can be a problem. But if bankers aren't fixing the issues that they've identified or examiners have identified, that generally will impact the trust between, you know, the two parties. And then another one that's rather common is saying something's fixed and then an examiner comes in and tests it and finds problems. Mm -hmm. Because remember, they're just sampling. And so if they sample and find issues, they uh, again, we'll lose trust very quickly in the management team that they're working with. So those are some of the you know common themes I think. Another one you don't see very often, but does exist is pushback. You know, when a regulator or examiner identifies an issue and a bank pushes back on it, you can push back, but it's got to be appropriate. And you have to recognize that in some cases, again, what an examiner is trained to do and look at and be concerned about from a risk perspective might be somewhat different than, you know, how you're sizing up those institutions mm -hmm. or issues yourself in the institution. Kathy would, and I've been on the, you know, examined a few times, but when, when the examiners come in, uh, you know, it, the, every bank operates in a, in a hierarchy with respect to the regulatory. And so the, you know, one of the concerns that I think banks, bankers at the, you know, actually responding may have is, is this an issue for me to be talking to the regulator about, or is there somebody more senior than me who really should bring this up, whether it's the scope or the or the, the back and forth? There's sort of a political context to it. Is it the same on the regulator on the regulator's side? It, it sure is, and that's a great point. I mean, one of the things that I, I counseled uh, institutions I work with on is make sure that you do you know escalate an issue before you bring it to a regulator to identify who should be providing that information to a regulator. Another thing is it, every issue doesn't have to be brought to an examiner, right? So understanding what your examiner cares about, what they're worried about, helps you as a banker identify what it is you should escalate to them. But within the agencies also, and they vary between the OCC, FDIC, and Federal Reserve, the examiner at the front line will have certain uh, authority or responsibility, and then other issues you know can have to be escalated internally within the agency. So, I think it works you know the same on both sides. Mm -hmm. um, so we're we're coming into a a period of time here. There's a you know I, I'm not making this up. There's actually economists predicting a recession, and we're debating how deep it will be. I'm sure the regulator sees the same thing. What would you be advising? Uh, your bank, what are you advising your bank clients to do right now uh, to help them best position for uh, uh, an economic deterioration? Should they be moving uh, to, to downgrade? Uh, are they, should they be doing it, bef I guess, ahead of or waiting for guidance from, from the regulator? Yeah, so again, what a regulator is going to focus on when they're concerned about the uh, you know, state of the economy primarily is going to be credit quality. And if you're a bank that doesn't have a you know, rigorous system for classifying your loans, developing your loan and lease loss uh, portfolio, et cetera, that's something that would certainly be working on and watching for examiners to look at more deeply. Um, with things like classifying loans, it's not required that a bank align with the regulatory framework of loss, doubtful, substandard, and special mention. But remember, that's the way they're going to look at your mm -hmm. portfolio. So the more you can map cleanly, you know, between however you want to risk rate. It's and a really interesting do, point. It helps. Every bank has their own system. And as a, as a syndicator of loans, it really wasn't until, I would say, nine or 10 
that the that that uh, we, I would have discussions internally about the syndication of a loan and say banks might perceive it as not as as a non pass credit and people would stare at me before that and just with like what are you talking about we rated it this here's our numerical system we rated it and but it does ultimately map into a regulatory uh, framework that is uh, special mention substandard doubtful loss which are non pass or or, or pass right a and. Again, I think to your point, prior to that, examiners really didn't, you know, push banks to have systems that map neatly to theirs. But when it has an effect, if you will, on the bottom line on, you know, market liquidity in terms of, like you said, loans you can hold, loans you can sell, then I think banks started to coalesce around uh, risk rating systems that start to look much more like now across at least the large institutions. Okay, so let's. Let's get to the, I think, the, the, the very topical, uh, the, the stress test just came out. So, Kathy, can you give us, I, I'm afraid, don't, 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 don't talk over my head here, but, you know, what, what is CCAR, <laughs> what are stress tests, you know, who conducts them, why were they put together in the first place as a result of, of, uh, of the 08 legislation? Sure. Nine. So, CCAR um, is the um, Comprehensive Capital Analysis and Review that's done by the Federal Reserve. And that started, I think it was in 2010. But the anchoring of the stress test really came about in 2008 with the financial crisis and you know, the first of banks that experienced runs and large banks right, that the regulators had to address. And so if we think about that scenario or the environment we were in back then, globally, we had large banks that were experiencing significant liquidity issues and as regulators we were trying to figure out you know what what can we do in the United States to help stem that tide and a lot of countries were doing stress testing but in the U.S. we had a number of conversations about what do we do when we get those results and through very healthy conversation across all agencies including you know treasury and other key stakeholders we made the decision that we were going to make the results public because through conversations with folks in the industry and especially investors, they said, if you don't make the results public, it's not gonna change anything. So made the decision we we're gonna make the results public and that really became then the stress tests that you see today, that foundation they've changed over time, the capital rules have changed over time with the capital buffer that came up the last few years, but their stress test buffer. But, but the goal and the purpose of the stress test really is to allow the regulators to conduct a horizontal, if you will, capital assessment across institutions. And the very largest banks get this every year and the Federal Reserve does it at the holding company level. And then the OCC will do at the bank level for banks, again, over 50 billion and generally every other year for those banks. So it, it really is a tool used by the regulators to, I think, provide some confidence really to other parties and interested stakeholders about the status of uh, large financial institutions in the U.S. Based on your, you know, you were you were inside the the regulatory uh, environment, and now you're you're still in touch, I'm sure, with a lot of your your colleagues there. Is are they happy with the way these are working? Are there are there problems for them with the current configuration, or does it feel stable to you? Um, I, it's reasonably stable. So the couple of things I think to keep in mind about this stress test, one, there's a level of transparency, right? They put out the scenarios, they put out results, but in the end, the determination of capital adequacy done by a regulator is also something that's done behind closed doors. So when we see things like these stress test buffers, you know, increasing now, Part of the reason for that is because the stress tests are countercyclical. So 2021 was a good strong year in the banking system. Regulators are going to look for uh, you know, more capital now because one of the issues with the crisis was you can't raise a lot of capital when you're in the middle right. of some sort of stress scenario. So I think that's something to take into consideration. And I think, yeah, I think overall the regulators are pretty satisfied with the process they have. And I think most bankers are too. Yeah, I think so too. The, the one thing that's notable um, is that some of the criteria change yearly, that the format stays about the same, but the criteria change, and you note that it's it's somewhat counter cyclical. What, what can you, I, I, look, I look through the hundred pages uh, or so of the most recent stress tests and I understood 
everything but the tables, I guess. But the uh, but based on what you see in the results, did, how did they look? Because there were some some large banks that uh, that looked like they might need to raise a little bit of capital in the out quarters, but nobody failed the test. How do you interpret the the most recent results? Well, I, I think another thing that's important about that, and this is you know again my view, but I don't think regulators look at the um, exact output every year and make any significant determinations. It's really the trends over time and how things change from year to year. So when we see financial institutions that maybe need to raise capital, it's probably because they have been running their capital lower than what a regulator would like. So remember, we have capital rules, but they're minimums and everybody far exceeded that. But wherever they've got institutions with maybe a concentration in the loan portfolio, they're mm -hmm. going to look for more of a, you know, stress test buffer because that's where, you know, problems will emerge. Or if a bank is, you know, again, generating loans in either industries that are of concern to a regulator and you and I've had, you know, great conversations over the years about some yeah. of the industries, you know, they care about, that's where they're going to be looking for more of a stress test buffer than maybe what the bank had initially intended. Mm -hmm. or expected. I, I, uh, I looked at some of the uh, the public disclosure, the quarterly earnings of some of the large financial institutions and without without picking on anybody, because uh, that would get both of us in trouble, The uh, uh, it, it looked to me like the, the magnitude of capital that banks think they need to raise is really isn't, isn't it, it's not an insurmountable, it's a short term issue. Uh, some banks are curtailing or, or, or cutting back significantly on their share repurchases. That's one way of doing it. Others, uh, you know, we hear in the market are implementing some 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 moves that would either raise the cost of capital internally, raise the bar for their capital tests, or or are um, uh, putting more restrictions on capital uh, in for for non core clients. But it it's not it's not actually uh, it, it looks all very doable. Do you do you see it differently? No, I I think you've got it spot on correct, and I think you know a couple of observations again having been in the banking industry in one way or another for longer than I would care to uh, uh -huh. disclose. <laughs> I mean, it is a very cyclical business, right? And what examiners know is that there will be a downturn. And, you know, and I've seen in my career, agriculture being one of the reasons for a downturn, commercial real estate, and certainly with the 2008 crisis, I mean, I remember conversations, uh, you know, within the OCC at the time of, the fact that we could see, if you will, deterioration or more generous lending terms in uh, residential real estate, but no one believed we'd ever see like the whole housing market decline. Right. So systemic, think, systemic yeah, problems. Yeah. Exactly. So I think but, that's what you see with the regulator is. Well, one of the things that's near and dear to the heart of uh, I think the audience for the for the podcast and asset based lending generally is the leveraged lending question. It's there. We haven't talked about it a lot lately, but the it, it always struck me how differently uh, different banks approach. Is it a leveraged loan? Is it not? It uh, does it, you know, is, is does it meet the ABL carve out or does it not? Uh, it, you know, there's black and white letters in all of the guidance that yet banks interpret very differently. And I, without without getting too specific, I just what's the context for uh, why you think banks it, interpret it differently? Do they just have a different dialogue with the regulator? I, I think that's often going to be the case. I mean, the couple things to remember about the leverage lending is one, it is guidance. So again, an examiner, depending on which agency you're talking about, may have more latitude at the front line to, uh, you know, interpret that differently, one uh, examiner to another. Generally, I would say where they are more generous, if you will, in their view on the leverage lending, it would be because the bank has a history of doing that lending well. They've got a stable management team. They appropriately risk rate their loan. So an examiner is more comfortable that their view of risk in that portfolio is akin to what the banker is expressing as mm -hmm. risk. But we've talked about it, leverage lending too. It, it's a it's a bellwether uh, from, you know, I think the regulator's perspective in terms of often, you know, the type of lending that can uh, emerge as problematic for a bank in a downturn and one of the mm -hmm. first portfolios. So, Barry, what, what, how do you think um, 
banks in the market are reacting to the current environment? And what do you hear about the stress test and some of the news that's coming forth from bankers? Yeah, uh, you know, there's always a, it, it, every bank has a, there's a, there's a dynamic, uh, you know, as you described between the banks and the regulators, you, you have to have profits in order to be a good public company. So there's the push for, for doing more, being more aggressive, pushing the envelope. And then there's also the risk team that has a different set of incentives. And there's a, there's a yin and yang to that. I think the, the current, the current environment is, is going in favor of the, the credit people. It almost has to. I mean, you know, the the tools that they have at their disposal, it's going to differ from bank to bank. But you 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 know, there's in advance of our next exam, let's make sure that we've conservatively rated things, which let, let's get inside of our the credit committee and not take things on that look like you're doing it at the wrong time in the cycle. So it has sort of a natural and it's having a natural dampening on bank lending uh, right now. It takes a while for that to take effect because You've got a pipeline of loans at any point in time, and it's not uh, like the, the memo comes out and everybody just immediately changes behavior. But it's definitely causing banks to be more cautious, as I think it should. Uh, but that that in and of itself restricts liquidity from the bank market. Um, in terms of the, the particulars on the stress test, there, I, I know that banks are, are want to uh, be more rigorous about their models. We saw it in the uh, dramatically in the in the early stages of the pandemic, every bank that didn't have a two-tiered approval system seemed to put one in. So you're approving credit and then you're also approving capital. And you're trying to, when you downgrade loans, it the, the consequence internally is that it attracts more regulatory capital. And the question for any bank is, are you going to use regulatory capital as the equivalent of a loss? In other words, are you going to say, we're losing money because we've just downgraded these loans? Or are you going to say, we're downgrading them because we have to, because it looks appropriate, but we're going to continue to make good credit. And as you point out, if you've got good risk mitigation, you know, you should be able to do that. I, I think the banks are definitely being more cautious. And I think that the stress test is resulting in some banks uh, looking for ways to restrict capital, particularly to the asset based market. You know, having said that, anybody who's predicting that that will increase pricing uh, is underestimating how competitive the market is and how many players there are in it. So I, I, I don't think there's any clear view on that. It, it is a very competitive market. And, and in that particular market, right, you have a lot of non-bank players. And so that's, you know, part yeah. of the issue, right? It's not exclusively bank banks. Yeah, that, that's an interesting point. Although, you know, banks have such a huge cost of funds advantage over the, any non-bank. Uh, you know, the, the, the non-banks borrow from banks as their cost of funds. And so, you know, it's, it's if you go if you cross that imaginary line or that gray line where banks won't finance you but a non-bank asset based lender will you have to it's almost discontinuous the banks will lend up to a certain price and then they won't take the risk anymore so it's not a smooth risk return curve it should be but it, it never has been and the non-banks have a floor and they won't go below it and actually in the current environment with other markets gapping out there there's a relative value calculation that they do so yeah there's a very healthy uh, robust non-bank asset base market, it's more expensive and probably more structured. Uh, and so companies will try to hold on to their banks, bank deals as long as they can until they're, until they're convinced that they can't. But a, a question for you, for you, Kathy, uh, how the, the non-banks, they have regular regulators, but it's none of the people you listed off. <laughs> At least I don't think so. How, how, <laughs> How does the regulator, I mean, they have the SEC if they're, if they're a BDC, they have that. But how, how do the regulators approach the rapid growth in the non-bank? And I'm just talking about asset-based lending, the non-bank lending world. Uh, and, and do you think that, that there, there needs to be some regulatory change as, as a result of, of, of the growth? Well, one of the changes in Dodd-Frank was prior to Dodd-Frank, we had the President's Working Group, which was actually a very small group of agencies, but informally, for instance, the OCC was not part of the president's working group technically, but we were invited to those meetings with Todd Frank, the Financial Stability Oversight Council was formed, which uh, you know sort of legitimized a large group of financial regulatory agencies that now meet on a regular basis. They've got the OFR for financial research. So I think there is a lot more dialogue that takes place between regulators of banks as well as other uh, financial institutions that are not banks. And uh, I think that's healthy, you know, for the system, again, for people to understand, because certainly in 2008, 
there was, I think, you know, a view anyway, that there were blind spots that people didn't really understand who was actually buying some of the, you know, mortgage paper. And I think there was, you know, again, a bubble created that many felt like we really didn't have a, a clean view on. So mm-hmm. I think the dialogue's much richer today. And which, which allows the reg- regulators then to act, you know, in a more uh, reasonable kind of manner, act earlier if they feel like, again, something needs to be, you know, tamped mm-hmm. down as opposed to, you know, being surprised. But the size of the non-bank uh, lending world has just grown so dramatically and it's really shining. We've, I've highlighted in a couple of the other um, podcasts that we've done, but because of the 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 lack of activity or the, the dysfunction of the high, the public high yield and the institutional loan market right now, the non-bank market is having a, a bright, a very good time, larger and larger facilities, more capacity. Do you think that that causes some urgency on the regulator to actually have a more formal uh, regulatory overlook? I, I suspect it will. Well, whether any actual action takes place, I'm not sure. But I know when I was a supervisor, anyway, that was always one of my biggest concerns was the you know non-bank lending and mm-hmm. what those players are doing. And it's certainly part of things like the shared national credit process. Right. So, yeah, there, there's certainly a lens on that. But I suspect yeah, the conversations are you know deeper and, and more frequent now within the agencies. Yeah. Well, Kathy, that's all the time we have. Uh, I, I should have said at the outset, but the title here, the inside scoop on regu- regulation for a, re- a former, I should say reformed, but a former OCC senior <laughs> leader. I think we hit all the hot buttons there. And I I uh, wish you luck with your consulting uh, business with your daughters. Thank you. And uh, sounds like yes, you're off to a running you. start. And to the extent that anybody listening wants to uh, wants to learn more about what they what how they might work with you, uh, Salt of the Earth Consulting, go to the website, give Kathy a call. She's been a, a real supporter. She's spoken at uh, ABCC a couple times, and hopefully we'll get her back soon. Kathy, thanks for joining today. Thank you, Barry. It was a pleasure. Well, that was an excellent discussion with Kathy Dick. Kathy's the founder of Salt of the Earth Consulting, her company, but also has a very long career with the OCC and in consulting for Promontory, as well as working at USAA. Kathy's got a very unique perspective, uh, having been on both sides of the regulatory table. Uh, And our goal was to pull back the curtain a bit on the regulatory environment, CCAR, stress tests, uh, leverage lending guidance, and to go through best practices for banks as they establish their regulatory frameworks and and their exams. And I think we covered that really well, so I won't won't recap too much of the discussion here. But we talked about the heightened caution in the current economic environment, uh, the relatively good results of the most recent stress test, but some of the conclusions that came out of it, and also touched on the regulation of non-banks, something I hope... uh, I hope everybody pays attention to as well uh, because of the growth of the non-bank lending world. I want to thank SFNet for their continuing support of the In the Know podcast and special thanks to Hillco Global for their, for their sponsorship of the entire In the Know series. 